Okay, so you will recall that we said that the space of P forms or the R forms on an M dimensional manifold is dual as a vector space to the space of um, to the space of M minus R forms um, on the manifold. Um, in, in, a, in a vector space sense. And this came from an observation that the number of basis elements of the space of R forms was the same, combinatorically speaking, as the number of elements, basis elements in M minus R forms. Right? This is because of the identity um, in how you choose for the set of M objects, R objects, is the same as um, M choose a minus R. Yeah. All right. So the question then is how do we actually establish this duality? And the answer to that is something called the Hodge star operator. The Hodge star operator is a linear map between these two spaces that today I will spend a little bit of time exploring some of the concepts of the linear map. And it's going to actually lead us much further than. Uh, that uh, this superficial map between these two spaces. It turns out that uh, I can use the large star operator to define a Laplacian on, uh, on a manifold. So, so far we've been talking about first derivatives, and first derivatives, where you're in derivatives, um, but you take the second derivative because g squared was zero. Right? So, there is something that is akin to second derivative operator, and this is a Laplacian operator. So the Boston operator, Boston operator needs another application of the of the derivative. In this case, it is not the derivative, the exterior derivative, but it's adjoint. So we're going to use this idea of um, the Hodge star operator to define an adjoint exterior derivative, um, which will allow us to define uh, a Laplacian. I'm not going to do the Laplacian right now because I need to. I need to go back to the story we were developing this. Uh, integrals. So we'll go to integrals. We'll do a couple. Of, uh, uh, we'll set up the machinery for integrals. We'll do a couple of integrals, and I'll show you how to do integrals on a general curve space M. And then I said where I want to go over the last ten lectures, uh, nine lectures, is um, in the direction of uh, the Rankin homology. So there it really is going to come into play, and we're going to use this idea of. Um, um, the Laplacian operator to show how we can split um, our space of forms to something called the Hodge decomposition of, of these forms, um, which will bring together some, some, well, it'll bring together all of the stuff that we've been talking about so far. Okay, so let me start today by telling you about the um, Hodge star operator. Um, the Hodge star. Is a linear map from omega r m to omega minus r m f 
and is an n dimensional one. Okay. Now, to make one caveat here. So far, everything that we've been doing has been kind of coordinate and metric independent. I haven't really made any mention of the metric to date. Right? It's kind of unlike if you're doing a course of differential geometry heading towards general relativity, where the metric is the name of the game, that's what we focus on, and everything is developing toward that. I would like the I would like to stay as metric independent and coordinate independent as you possibly can for as long as you can because once you took one or two when you head in that direction then the, the results that you get are actually topological they're global feature manifold we're working on as well as the um, as well as the, the structures that we define the for the first time really. When we introduce the hot star operator, we're going to need the metric. So we're going to need what we would call a Riemannian manifold. I can see the glare. I mean, you can lower it to the point where you can see the board. Okay. <laughs> 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 Yeah, all right. Uh, but let me, let me, uh, when I was a postdoc, I was in the seminar in our group in, uh, at Brown. And this was back in the day when everybody, not everybody, but some people were still using overhead projectors and you know, it's transparency. It's just a game, and they have a lot of transparency. You turn on the overhead projector. And it turns on and it goes pop, and it's pop, pop right? So the bulb popped. And so then everybody's freaking out just to find a bulb for this thing. Somebody in the back sits, <laughs> sits back and says, How many goes with another tape to take the light off? <laughs> okay, so for the first time, we really have to introduce the idea of the, of the metric. Now, um, I said before that we can take the four Maxwell equations and we can express them in the language of differential geometry. And the first set of equations was the statement that um, if the electro, um, sorry, the the um, electromagnetic potential can be written as a one form. Then the electromagnetic tensor or Faraday tensor um, can be written as the exterior derivative of that. So that's a two form. And so then because d squared is zero, df is equal to zero. And df equals zero was the statement that um, curls don't have a gradient. So gradient of curl is zero, and gradients don't have a curl. Okay. Um, so if I have a gradient field and I find the curl of that gradient field and the curl of the gradient is zero, right? That was one equation. And the other one was that um, if I find the divergence of the curl, right, because the curl is staying in the same place, the divergence of the curl is zero. So two statements are contained in here. They're purely geometric statements. They have nothing to do with any dynamics of the electromagnetic field. Okay. Um, so their their properties of the definition of the exterior derivative or curves and gradients and divergences. We'll show a little later the example that I'm going to use that the other two maximum equations in vacuum can be written like this: d of the Hodge star of f equals zero. Now, if f is a two form. 
on a four-dimensional spacetime, right? Then star f is a two minus two form. Uh, is a four minus two equals two form. So star f is another two form in this case. So d star f gives me the other two Maxwell equations. The difference between these two equations, uh, this equation and this equation, is that this one involves a metric. Okay. And as we'll see, this set of Maxwell equations actually contain dynamical information about the electromagnetic uh, about the electromagnetic field, whereas this is just a statement of the Okay. All right. So that is to say, if you didn't know anything about electric and magnetic fields, and all you knew were things about vector fields, you would be able to deduce Maxwell's two of Maxwell's equations, right? Because it's literally just a statement of the Okay. Now um, again, for the first time, we have to bring in, in a practical way, the idea of the metric into this space, uh, into this story. So, in what follows, most of the results I'm going to um, derive for you or quote for you will be about Riemannian um, uh, spaces. So that is to say, this this manifold will be put with some metric. And that metric will have some positive definite signature. It means if I diagonalize that metric, I'll only have positive entries in the, on the diagram. Right? This is to be contrasted with what's called Lorentzian manifolds, where um, the signature is indefinite. So if I diagonalize that uh, Lorentzian manifolds, I will have at least one negative uh, entry on the diagram. Right? So space time is an example of a Lorentzian manifold. Right, where space is an example of a Riemannian manifold. If I diagonalize the metric of space, then I will end up with something that only has positive entries in the diagram. If I diagonalize the entries on the space time, then I will end up with something that has one negative sign. Now that negative sign, well, there, there will be an odd number of negative signs, depending on the convention that you use. The convention that general relativists usually use is that time is assigned to the negative sign. Right. This has implications for a lot of the properties of uh, the Hot Star operator and its action on uh, on forms. Okay. Most of what I'm going to be telling you will be to do with Riemannian manifolds. So the metric of M will be a will be um, a positive signature metric. Um, <coughs> Okay, um, where there's any distinguishing features, I will tell you about the Lorentzian uh, results that we've seen. Okay, so my statement is that this duality between the space of um, R forms and M minus R forms is accomplished by this um, star right now. To, to write down the explicit action of the hot star operator, I need to just recall what we talked about some time ago, which is a completely anti-symmetric um, tensor. Epsilon um, mu one m on the m-dimensional space capital M um, is defined to be either plus one, minus one, or zero if set mu one to mu m is an even permutation of the set of numbers in one to two to m it's minus one set is an odd equation of one to m and it's zero otherwise by otherwise i mean if any one if any index is repeated then it's not a permutation and it's zero so this object is a completely anti object i say any two 
in the CTH, it comes to the minus sign. Okay, we've just studied this before when we were setting up, uh, when we talked about tensors and setting up structures on manifolds. Um, And like any other tensor, I can raise in lower indices of epsilon um, using the metric tensor. So, for example, epsilon near one to near m upstairs is g new one. New one, G, new two, new two, two to G, new M, new M, epsilon, new one, two, two, new M. Okay, and that's the meaning you upstairs in the metric is the, is the inverse, matrix inverse um, of. G So G new is G new. Okay. So <clears throat> given this, we can now define. Uh, so, really, it's a map from Omega R M to Omega M minus R M. To its action on the basis elements of a set of R forms on M. So omega sorry, star acts on dx v1, which to dx mean n. Uh, sorry, mu r. To give me the square root of the determinant, the absolute value of the determinant of G divided by um, M minus R factorial times this completely anti symmetric tensor in one to be R and then mu. R plus one downstairs through mu m dx mu r plus one where to dx mu. So that's the action of the R star operator. Now you can see that it takes in an R form and outputs an M minus R form. Okay, this is an R form. The output here is an M minus R. And you can see explicitly that the metric on this manifold enters into the action of the large star number. Yeah. So with this definition, If I act on the basis of set of function zero falls on the manifold one, in fact, let me talk this convention the star acting on one, 
is root mod g over m minus zero is n factorial epsilon. There are no indices upstairs and um, m indices downstairs. This is one due to m dx mu one to dx mu m. But this guy has the anti symmetric tensor multiplied by this guy is just m factorial times dx one to two dx m. So this is root of g dx one, which to the units and definition of root seven. In other words, this is nothing but the volume form that we defined the last time on the manifold. This is we were calling for. And this is the invariant volume element on it. More generally, I can take an R form. So if I have omega as the R form one of our factorial omega mu one to mu r dx mu one with to dx mu r. And I calculate the hot star of that. Then this is one of our R factorial M minus R factorial omega mu one to mu R epsilon mu one to mu R uh, mu R plus one to mu M dx mu R plus one yes by the way uh, I should mention this explicitly but uh, it should be clear that the set of mu r plus one to mu n is complement of um, the set of mu one to mu r in the set of objects, set of numbers one mu to n. Yeah, um, my star of omega is there a very key looking for the not going to be there. Uh, is there a square of G missing? It's The very next thing I'm going to say is the square of G. Uh, it, it is what they are. Okay. okay, so that's so given an R form, 
this is what the what star is. And you can see it's going to be an R star is an M minus R ball. This guy lives in omega M minus R. I can also extend the action. So this is what we would call a coordinate basis on on um, on the manifold, right? So basically, um, sorry, a coordinate basis of the set of our forms on the manifold. So I give you the manifold, I can count the manifold in front of the coordinate x mu, um, associated with a set of coordinate x mu on the set of one form, say there's, there's the object dx mu. Right? And then I build up all forms by taking weight products um, of those to get a basis for omega. So these are, this is a coordinate basis on omega. I can extend this to a non coordinate basis. Uh, let's call it Peter. Yeah, Peter. And Peter alphas are linear combinations of the coordinate basis to some set of matrices um, E alpha mu. And the hot star acts on theta um, alpha one when you alpha uh, r give me one over m minus r. Um, epsilon alpha one to alpha r uh, beta say alpha one of uh, M theta of this one theta the only difference you will note is this one here as opposed to the square of the determinant of the metric that's because of the non coordinate basis the square of the determinant of the matrix uh, metric is one because the uh, Metric is a conic assumption. So we're just multiplying things in one diagonal and all those things are one and to get one. Um, so epsilon with these alphas, the non coordinate indices, um, are defined in the same way as epsilon with the news. Um, plus one minus one or zero, except that instead of raising and lowering indices with, uh, with the metric G, we raise the lower indices with delta. So the indices Are is a lower with delta of the beta. Okay. Here's one kind of thing that one could make with the Lorentzian manifold. If I'm dealing with the Lorentzian manifold in a non coordinate basis, I raise and lower indices with eta alpha beta, the metric on the moving process space. So, so delta alpha beta uh, um, 
delta alpha beta and a diagonal length matrix of the others. And or beta after beta plus M is Zen. And which alpha beta in the diagonal matrix with minus one in the first entry plus one progress. Okay. All right. So The fact that in a non coordinate basis, I raise and lower indices with delta, actually, and, and I don't have to keep track of square roots of the determinant of e here, actually makes some calculations quite easy, well, relatively speaking. Um, so, for example, if I want to understand what happens if I act twice for the Hodge star operator, it's clear that because star takes me from an R form to an N minus R form, Another action of star is going to take me from that m minus r form to an m minus m minus r form, which is an r form. So two operations of star are going to be um, uh, a linear map from omega of, uh, from omega r instead of r forms of this up. Except because I've got an epsilon floating in this story, there's a chance that they're going to be plus or minus signs to keep track of, right? In fact, the plus or minus signs usually depend on whether we're in a Lorentzian manifold or a Riemannian manifold. Um, so let me show you how that would work. And in this case, you can certainly do this calculation with the coordinate basis, with the d-axis, but it's easier to keep, uh, to keep track of things if you do it in the non-coordinate basis. So let's just see what we're operating on this. So suppose then that I've got some R form. Um, in omega, which I'm going to write in a non coordinate basis as follows. So, omega, omega is one of our factorial, omega uh, mu one here we use early letters for the basis, theta alpha one. And I act on omega with the Hodge star operator, then I'm going to get star omega is one over half factorial, um, omega alpha one to alpha r, and then the star acting on this guy. This only has this factor of one here, so times one over m minus r factorial um, epsilon alpha one to alpha r, let's say beta um, r plus one to beta m beta beta. This one range to theta, theta m. And then I'm going to apply another touch star to this star on this side. These are his components as a least, and that second star only acts on this. This is one of our factorial. Um, 
times m minus r factorial one omega alpha one to alpha r taken into account this guy um, epsilon alpha one to alpha r beta r plus one to beta n and then I'm going to get another one of our all factorial, yeah, because I'm acting on m minus r factorial, m minus m minus one in r. And then epsilon beta r plus one to beta m, uh, let's say gamma one to, to gamma r. All of that times uh, theta gamma one, where to theta right gamma r. Now notice the following. Remember, I can raise the lower indices on this. Um, epsilon with delta. Okay, so this thing, same as let's collect all the factorials as one over factorials squared m minus r factorial. This guy omega alpha one to alpha r. Then I'm going to drop all the indices down here. But my convention is if I see indices repeated upstairs and downstairs, then I sum over them. But I'm still coming over these indices, I just keep track of this explicitly. So for once, you know, break with my tradition and sum over alpha, gamma, and alpha, beta, and gamma. This is just a formal expression that I'm using to remind myself that I have to keep summing over them even though they're not upstairs and downstairs. But there's a reason I want to do this. So this is now epsilon alpha one to alpha r beta r plus one to beta m. And this guy is the same betas down here, upstairs and low and downstairs on an epsilon. Okay. These guys are downstairs. I'm going to bring these guys downstairs as well, but I'm going to keep the structure the same. So everything that's not beta I want to be in the front, and everything that's beta I want to be in the back. Okay. When I do that, I have to take this beta and commute it to R of x. Remember, this is an OBGM expanding test. So I'm going to pick up a factor of minus one to the R. And then I have to do it for each one of these guys. So this is a factor overall going to be a factor of minus one to the R times the minus R. Okay. So Yeah, I think we did one. So that's minus one to the R and M minus R epsilon alpha one to alpha R beta R plus one to beta N epsilon gamma one to gamma R beta R plus one. To beta m. Um, and then there's inside that as well times beta gamma one, squared to beta gamma r. This thing here summed over the betas. Yeah. That's right. This thing here summed over betas. Is R factorial times M minus R factorial times delta out 
one, gamma one, delta alpha two, uh, gamma two, all the way through to delta alpha r, gamma r. You can show this explicitly. It's uh, written um, with determinants uh, um, by picking some small set of numbers. So if you look at RB, for example, and you can show that this <coughs> is true. And then if I sum out over the gammas, these deltas are going to change all the gammas into alphas. Okay. So this is going to be minus one. It's going to be minus one to the R times M minus R. We've got by the net exchange. This R factorial is going to take up one factor here, the minus R factorial is going to take up this guy, so this is going to give me a one over R factorial. And then I'm going to get omega alpha one through omega alpha R. And then this is going to replace the delta, they're going to replace all the gamma with alphas. So this is theta. Alpha one with theta alpha r. And this stuff is all just omega. So that's just minus one, the r and n minus r back to omega. In other words, what we've learned from this is twofold. One is that. Minus one to the R and M minus R and star and star is an identity on the space of balls. Second point is that the inverse of this linear map, star inverse, is just minus one to the r and m minus r star. Okay. So now we look. We learned what the inverse of the of our star operator is as well. I can also use the power star operator to define now an inner product of two R forms. That's all. By the way, these results, and in particular, the factor of um, minus one that comes out of the story, is different for Lorentzian manifolds than for um, Riemannian manifolds. Okay? So, depending on whether you're looking at and textbooks that are geared towards relativity, the Lorentzian manifolds are what you work with, or more traditional differential geometry and Germanian manifolds, you'll find different experiments for these. So keep track of the, of the experiments. This is what we did here and where this comes from. Okay. Um, okay. So we can use. Define a an inner product on omega r or okay. So in particular, if we take let's say omega and um, one over r factorial. Omega mu uh, one to mu r dx mu one to dx mu r and eta 
as one over all factorial. Eta mu one gives one gives one gives one. Then note the following. If eta is an R form, then star eta is an M minus R form. If I take that M minus R form and wedge it together with another R form, I'm going to get an M form, right? And any M form is going to be proportional to the volume element. So omega wedge star eta is an M form on Given these components for the R forms, let's ask then what is the components, uh, what are the components of omega wedge um, star eta? So omega wedge star eta is one of an R factorial coming from omega multiplied by the one of the factorial coming from eta. And with that omega mu one two mu r. Um, mu say so eta mu one two mu r. Um, and now I'm going to go back. On the basis, so there's a factor of root one d over m minus r factorial that came from taking a star of this guy. And now a couple of epsilons. There's one epsilon. epsilon. U one, U r. Let's call this mu r plus one due to mu m. Yes, mu r plus one. Yes, mu. Yeah. And then we play the same game that we did um, in this story with the double application of of uh, of stop. And then we drop indices, keep track of um, root one piece, um, and then sum out using the same identity. And I'm going to leave this as an exercise for you. It's really the same. So, follow this, uh, complete the set set. So, this is just one over r factorial. And again, the same minus R factorial and another factor of R factorial is going to be cut for that one that determines that density. Um, omega mu one to mu R, eta mu one to mu R, root on G, EX one to yeah, exactly. Right. And this guy again is just the volume form now. So as I said, it's an M form, and it's an M form that's proportional to the volume form. And written in this form, it's clear that whether I took omega wedge star eta or eta wedge star omega, I would get the same thing. Uh, it's symmetric in omega and uh, eta. And this product is in fact symmetric.
Oh my god, we are just sub eta, it's the same as eta, we are just star omega. And we can now use this to define a symmetric inner product of the space of our class. That's all. So let me be clear about it. Whenever I have something proportional to the volume form, it's it has a well-defined integral. It's, it's in fact an integral that you've already been familiar and working with when you did you know one or two three-dimensional integrals. It's an integral of a function times the volume form dx one through dx. This requires street one g stuff to this Okay, so this is a well-defined thing that you can integrate. How you actually do the integral, this is something that we're going to come to in the next chapter, but the integral is well defined. So now I'm going to define the inner product between omega and eta. To be the integral of omega with star eta over the map. And this thing is the inner product on the set of R forms on end. And you can see that its properties. R1 that it is symmetric. Symmetry of the inner product follows from the symmetry of this. Um, so omega inner product eta and this eta inner product omega. And two, that, that if in addition M is a Romanian manifold, um that then only oh the inner product with itself is greater than or equal to zero. This is probably being separated by no basis. This is no longer true when you have a lower in yeah. So let me conclude with an example. So let's take um, M to be. R3 will be using the usual Euclidean metric on R3 uh, and the usual orientation. Usual orientation, say so right hand orientation. Um, and then position, I'm going to take coordinate basis set the one forms. And let's work out all of the um, much stuff. So, star on dx is the one form working on three dimensional space. So, this is going to give me a two form. That two form will be dy, which we said. Star 
dy is dx. So dz, which dx. And so dz is dx, which y. Then we can act on two forms dx with dy. This will be dz. The star, the one star on the two form is a d minus two is a one form. Star dy with dz is dx. Star z dx is y. If I take the star of the basis for the set of functions on M, one, then this is just the volume form dx, which dy, which is z, as we talked about earlier. It's going to be like the star of dx, which dy, which is z, that's just. More generally, if omega, if let's say omega x dx plus omega y dy plus omega z dz, and let's say eta is eta x dx plus eta y dy plus eta z dz. Then notice that um, star of omega with, with eta is just omega Y eta z minus omega z eta y dx plus omega z eta x minus omega x eta z dy plus omega x the y minus omega y is x is that in other words just cross product yeah well, 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 I want to agree how uh the one form there is it I don't know if this may be the same question but is it okay to just leave them like that or we can just simplify them into for example large operation of dy can we say that it's minus dx which is that or we just leave it like that can we arrange it like alphabetically in order for it to just make sense um so let's say we I'm arranging it in, in cyclic computation of XYZ. That's why I don't have to keep track of minus signs. So it, will, it also wouldn't be wrong if I just try this. Um, for example, the simple one, most of the one of the You want to write minus? Yeah, it's great to do that. So I prefer to sacrifice the alphabet to minus signs, but it's up to you. Okay. But the point I want to make is. That we now with a uh, star operator, we now have yet another way of thinking of a cross product. Okay. But there's, there's some additional insight to be gained from there, which is that you very specifically needed this guy, the star, because if the internet of one forms and the wedge product is a two form, to make it back into a one form in R3, you needed a much star operator. This is why the cross product is defined in R3 and the world. However, that, that you know, seems like 
which products and forms exist in any of data that I want. But when the star acting on two form, use another one form, but the star acting on a two form that is made out of which product and one form so produce another one form. So let's think what we're doing here. The combination of the wedge product and the star takes in two one forms and produces another one form. The thing that was special about the cross product is that it took two vectors and produced a third vector. Okay, so that structure works in R3 and it works in R3 because 3 minus 2 is 1. So that's the really deep statement here. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, what is work R7 as well? Um, so we can't think of a little bit more complicated in R7, but the additional thing that R7, R7 has, has, has is um, there's this, there's this thing about the crazy. R7 has in a, R3 and R7 are the only places that we find the, the stereomorphic structure that, that none of the other um, spaces have in between. So uh, uh, there's a there's a lot more to go into this, and I can give you some some references. But it has to so it has to do with two things. One is the counting, um, and the other one is um, that. Um, the structure of different morphisms on, on, on R7 are the, the same as R3. So you can find, uh, actually, no, that's like, uh, um, well, it's not cut, but it's not relevant. Um, it, it, the county comes out the same, but it's a little more complicated. Okay. All right.